Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of the Rocky Terrain podcast. Today is January the 21st while we're recording and this episode will probably launch tomorrow. For this episode today, we're going to look at the Alien Worlds Netflix show and talk about the science involved. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Otherwise, um, I'm Thomas and with me as always is my good friend Dennis. Hello there. <laughs> I like that you know uh, you know found your thing, you know. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've always been an Obi Wan Obi Wan Kenobi guy, so yeah, maybe it'll, it'll stick around. <laughs> <laughs> Another happy landing. I think I will stay with Hello and will come to let me have something better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's now three weeks since we um, uploaded our last episode. Dennis, do you want to tell us why? Yeah, uh, actually, we planned to already record this episode last week, but I have, as I've already said uh, in the end of the year episode, uh, I've ordered a PC, uh, a brand new tower, at long last, uh, I decided to spend the money and get a good PC. And it was scheduled to arrive by the 19th or the 20th of January. And we decided to just delay this episode for a week because I am always doing the recording with my laptop and Let's just say it doesn't really handle recording too well. Sometimes it's pretty tough for Thomas to uh, listen to my audio. <laughs> um, for example, there is an about, I think, 1.2 second delay at the time, currently. Yeah, it's, it's always a bit problematic. That's why I'm always constantly talking right into you. Yeah, and yeah. The, most of the times I just cut smart, but that... <laughs> yeah but but that was why we decided to just wait another week and just start relaunch our two week schedule uh this week but yeah unfortunately the pc hasn't arrived yet but we've decided to not wait yet another week and to just record today instead yeah um also if you may have noticed or not, uh, our episodes were down and are now live again. Uh, we've encountered a problem, but we fixed it and we finally could re-upload it. Um, so yeah, that also happened. Yeah. Otherwise, let's get to, I think, like the main part of, our, not the main part, but of our podcast, but our introduction part, which we still have no name for. The news section like in every other podcast yeah <laughs> uh, you always just tend to mark it as what's generic new? news section <laughs> random <laughs> things happening in our lives <laughs> that's also good the um, randomness so <laughs> tell us about your random things happening in your life <laughs> <laughs> yeah um right now i um once again working at the collection of the Natural History Museum here in Münster. Uh, I My contract ended back in October and now I've signed a new one for about nine months. And it's a collection job. I'm busy sorting mammal bones, uh, mammal bones, ice-aged mammal bones, and honestly, I'm pretty happy to be out working again. We do have pretty strict restrictions in terms of uh, protecting ourselves. Uh, you know, everybody has to wear masks properly, of course, and we have to pay attention to spacing. Especially when we do our breaks, we have to really spread out all over the building but i'm just happy to be back at the job 
uh, currently. Otherwise, I have once again started reading papers, which I stopped during the two weeks from Christmas to New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. And already in 2021, some interesting things have been published. For example, one paper I read was about new evidence for cannibalism in Tyrannosaurid dinosaurs. And this is not something truly new in and of itself, but it's fascinating because evidence for cannibalism in these dinosaurs keeps coming up uh, time and time again. And Tyrannosaurus aren't even the first carnivorous dinosaurs which have been reported to have been carnivorous and how paleontologists can know this is by finding bones, in this case tyrannosaur bones, which have tooth marks on them, and by then trying to match these tooth marks to uh, the teeth of other predatory dinosaurs. And in this case it shows that likely another tyrannosaurid has been at work. Um, a paper has been published about a new pterosaur bone from the, and I don't even know how to pronounce this name, the Kaiparowitz formation from the late Cretaceous, Cretaceous of uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah in the USA. Um, I haven't really read too much of that paper as of yet because uh, I haven't really had time so far. And uh, it's about one isolated bone, but it's pretty interesting because pterosaur bones are pretty thin walled and <laughs> every pterosaur bone found and described is a pretty, is an occasion to celebrate a little bit. <laughs> Because these the bones of these animals are pretty rare, and uh, yeah, it's interesting because I, I just skipped through the paper a few moments ago, and it seems that it stems from inland deposits. But I think the the author hasn't assigned this bone to this particular pterosaur group, so yeah. But that's really pretty much everything new. Um, as I said, happy to be working again more regularly and still we have to see how this whole situation due to the coronavirus will develop over the next few weeks because in Germany we do currently once again have stricter restrictions and it could be possible that we are not allowed to work in the near future, in the collection in the near future. We don't know yet, but new regulations could come out any day. So it's maybe <laughs> we'll already have to stop working again and switch to home office or something like that. We'll see. But yeah, that's pretty much everything from my side. So what about you? The king organizing fossils in home office uh no uh there is this lower cretaceous dig site from Balva, and uh, you know we clean the rocks and we sieve out the rocks and uh, the fossils from <clears throat> the finer clay sediment and once these are cleaned uh, still the fossils have to be separated from the rocks and <laughs> For example, what one other student frequently has done over, over, over the past few months was he took some sediment home with him <laughs> and he just picked out the fossils at home. So I don't know, maybe we'll switch to something like that, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me... It is interesting that I'm now more aware of new paleontology paper than planetary science papers. <laughs> As <laughs> of the second. 
<laughs> is currently a bit stressful for me because yeah exams are now a thing again uh, in a very close future there are also some talks we have to do for university so a lot of stuff for university is currently happening and that takes a lot of time mm. otherwise um i have uh I think I've talked about it in the Christmas new slash New Year's episode about the abstracts that I'm writing for the LPSC, so the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which will be online this year and not in Houston, which is very sad. I mean, it's good, but it is, you know, you yeah. understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've submitted two abstracts. Um, so one is about the things I've done for my bachelor thesis, so um, tectonics related. And then, which I submitted as talk, so you could submit one as a talk and the other one as a poster. Um, and then I've also submitted another abstract about the things that I've done in the, um, how do you call that, during my time at the DLR in Berlin. Your internship. practical training internship, yeah. Yeah. Which is about the ExoMars project. So the European Space Agency's rover that will hopefully launch uh, 2022. Mm. Both interesting projects, and I guess, I hope that I'm able to um, talk about these in the future. I mean, I would be able now because they're now published as an abstract, but... I think at least for the uh, Mars abstract, I would want to wait till we get like no uh, more data. But yes, both some cool projects. I'm looking forward for the conference. The conference this time will be a bit different, so because it's online and you don't have live talks, but you have to make video, make a video of your talk and then upload it. So. This is going to be interesting. I'm a bit afraid of that. I would, I would prefer just talking live. Mm. Somehow mm. fits more to my talking style. You can be a, a bit perfectionistic at times, uh, so I can yeah. imagine, I can imagine you going over the video footage again and again until after hours of work you are finally satisfied. Yeah, I would probably record it like 10 times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be interesting. And then there's the poster, um, which also, there was an update how the posters will work. Um, so they will work differently now than I've told you before. There's like an online tool now where you can upload them into, and then people can just comment on these, and you can just answer the comments per text during the weeks where the post is online no okay so yeah i think that's that's actually a good idea to do this um but however yeah i would have preferred the live talk anyway um is there anything more oh yeah i got the grade for my bachelor thesis um which is a very good grade <laughs> i'm very happy about that congrats and Thanks. And with that, I finally have all the grades of my bachelor. So um, I don't know. How is it currently? How will you guys receive your... What's it called? Zeugnis. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I can tell you in about a sec. Is it your final report? Yeah. Testimony? Certificate. Your bachelor certificate 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 yeah um i don't know <laughs> so, by the way german word of the day <laughs> um we have to so you write them an email and then they will send you i don't know if it's the certificate or like just the official paper where like all of the grades are in i don't know if there's some different way to do this currently yeah and no, I, just, I, th I don't think so 
like normally isn't there like an not a show but an event in the summer where we get like the very official you know like the things that you can put on your wall stuff like yeah. that yeah usually there is but um i that's why i was asking because i don't really know how they're going about this at this at this time yeah i, I don't think that they know that too <laughs> yeah, yeah. no i yeah. can't really imagine that there's going to be any ceremony in the near future so yeah, I was just yeah. curious whether you knew more about that. Yeah, I I mean, I will tell you <laughs> once I know. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm already doing my master classes and this is possible because there are some special regulations due to the COVID um, where I can, well, submit my certificate a bit later, but still can be in my master's, which is um, pretty good. Hmm. okay i guess with that we've concluded our random guys talk about random stuff <laughs> section we will find a name <laughs> once or we'll just change the name every day uh, every time yeah who knows okay so we will now go into a break and then we will return with our main topic about the alien world's TV show on Netflix. So, because we are always so much on time and always up to date with current events, we have decided to, after about one month, a bit more than a month, <laughs> finally watch Alien Worlds and also add another review to the ones that have already been published online. So maybe to first explain what exactly Alien Worlds is. It is a documentary, a four episode documentary dealing with, well, alien worlds. So it is centered around the topic of astrobiology, how could life have developed on other planets, and how could it have evolved on planets with completely different natural circumstances than Earth. And basically the show splits itself between CGI parts, where we can actively see the creatures they designed for this documentary and between sequences on Earth comparing or showing the viewer where they got their ideas from. Yeah, that was a good introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what we are now going to do is we are first going to go through the contents of the episodes. So just to give everyone a little overview of what this episode is about and what is presented in general. So for that purpose, spoiler alert, of course, because we are going to talk about everything shown in this documentary. Yeah. Exactly. So with that, do we want to go on the first episode? Yeah, uh, actually, I thought maybe you could start. You could introduce us to the planet because you are the yep. planetary science guy. Yeah, um, very conveniently. I don't have that much notes on the first planet, but I will have on the later ones. <laughs> um, so the scenario is following. We have a rocky planet, but a larger planet with higher gravity than Earth. Which also, so this is like the first important scenario, higher gravity. The second important scenario that we have is that the atmosphere is much denser than Earth. So we have, I don't think that I said how much denser the atmosphere is. I would guess it's probably something in between Venus and Earth for what I've seen, but it could be more. Um, 
Yeah, so these are the two important scenarios, the two restrictions or the two rules that a planet gives. And this is, first of all, high gravity, and secondly, a very dense atmosphere. Yeah, um, and with that, <laughs> let's talk about the aliens here. <laughs> yeah, so as Thomas has said, the basic premise here is that we have a denser atmosphere. The gravity on this planet is higher than on Earth, meaning everything is basically pulled towards the planet to a greater degree than on Earth. Everything would feel heavier and also the different molecules of the air or of the atmosphere of this planet called Atlas. Um, they are pulled stronger towards the surface so you have a thicker atmosphere and this is where the first alien is introduced which is the sky grazer a big flying animal or animal like creature um, they say that it's a very large creature but once again here we don't really we aren't really told how big exactly and uh, they have three or six wings two big main wings and two smaller ones in front and behind to steer themselves through the air to maneuver they feast on spores or what they call spores uh, i'll get into why i think that terms like animals and spores and fungi and plants are a bit difficult in this case but they say that they yeah. feast, feast on the spores of quote-unquote plants um, which form dense clouds in the atmosphere once again going back to um things being pushed closer together, being pulled towards the ground and not being able to dis disperse as much as they would on Earth. You have these dense spore clouds and this dense atmosphere supports these big sky grazers uh, because they are essentially... You have a denser cushion of atmosphere below you which you can easier glide through if you're a big creature. You then and that's have... why they also don't land. They're always in the air. They yeah. never rest. Yeah, exactly. And then you have the predators, which are little creatures or smaller, way smaller than the sky grazers. Um, they possess, yeah, what I would call a proboscis, a tube, a flexible tube, with, with which they penetrate the skin of their victim. They have two grasping claws or two arms with grasping claws on them. And on their back, they have an inflatable sack where uh, they, or close to which they house hydrogen producing bacteria. So at will, they can inflate these sacks and float up into the atmosphere. And they then yeah. fall down on the sky grazers, grasping on them and trying to force them to the ground. And then once they again, look a we... bit like small hot air balloons with arms. Yeah, yeah, essentially they. And are... that's what I called them in my <laughs> sketches. So <Yeah. clears throat> most of the times, I've I've written some weird stuff now going through it again. And yeah. I kind of always give them weird names because I never um, understand their real names. I kind of always missed it. It was like, what, what are they called again? And I, I had mean, to find like somebody to describe them. Yeah, some of them have actual names, but some of them yeah. don't, I think. <clears throat> um, yeah, but there is a third creature involved, which are the scavengers, which are formless creatures living on the ground. Formless meaning they don't have anything, anything really supporting their body inside them or outside them. They don't have something resembling a skeleton and 
they just engulf and devour, uh, devour everything they can find, basically. And in the end, this episode is centered around the topic of specialists versus generalists. So you have these very specialized creatures, the sky grazers, feasting on the spores in the atmosphere, having a very, very particular lifestyle. They're predators, which have very particular lifestyles. They are very dependent on their food source, both of them, while these scavenger scavengers on the ground can, well, feast on anything they find. They can eat anything they find and they will survive times of stress with a higher, higher likelihood than the specialists will, because the specialists have way more requirements to exist, way more specific requirements. Yeah, and that's uh, mostly the first episode. Or do you want to add anything? I think we. What's also interesting is that we see the life cycle of these um, uh, sky sky grazers. Sky grazers, right? So yeah. we see how they uh, mate, and also how they get the children. So, and that's um, so. First of all, they mate in the air, of course. And mm. then the females will land to lay down their eggs. But while doing this, they they die. So it's they kill themselves for um well laying their eggs. Or were the eggs? I don't know. Were the yeah. eggs or like the eggs, right? Yeah, yeah eggs. <clears throat> At least something yeah. like eggs. Then the babies hatch and they immediately uh, wander off towards a cliff, the nearest cliff they can find, while they are being eaten or hunted by the scavengers using the opportunity. Uh, and then they yeah, jump off the next possible cliff. They extend their wings and... To fly. Well, yeah, start their life in the air, basically, to never land again until... Yep. The female, at least the females, uh, have mated and are ready to lay eggs. But I said that they need a bit time. You know, they they have to stay on Earth for I don't know how long, but a period of time before they can fly. Um, mm, yeah, I I don't know. I think I got that they would try to immediately go to the next cliff have they explicitly stated but that but hadn't you didn't you had the point that you could see like even their arms evolving into no 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 you yeah. flight position no you, you couldn't see their wings of, uh, develop but you could see how while they were marching towards uh, the cliff the wings would slowly start to lower from a vertical position after hatching to a more horizontal position i don't know it's to me it it it, it reminded me of a moth or a butterfly after uh, going through metaphor metamorphosis like unnittering the wings i don't know that that was what i got from that but oh, interesting yeah I did, I did understand it a bit different yeah. Um, yeah, and then the the episode ends with an impact, but we don't really see anything. We just see the the meteorite striking the planet. Yeah, and this is where they make the point about specialists versus generalists that the scavengers yeah. would be the ones surviving, while the specialized creatures are more likely to die out because they are more vulnerable, basically. Do we want to talk about the examples that they use to compare them to? Um, so what we... the show does, maybe for an explanation, is they show the animals on a planet for a short period of time. And then the show moves to Earth where they search for examples that um, are kind of similar here on our planet. Yeah. Yeah. These and... are... 
Hmm? I think that's a part of the show that we are definitely going to talk about later. Um, but do we want to go like into the detail of what comparisons they made here, or do we want to get in like specific ones that we find were good or not so good in the end? Mm, I mean, we could maybe mention them here, but I would like to discuss them or how fitting they were in the second half of the review. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, for example, the predators were compared to falcons. Um, so falcons dive down onto their prey using their forward or better downward momentum to stun their prey or even uh, kill their prey as far as I know. And um, this was compared to what these predators are doing. They extended their mm. gas sacs, they rose into the atmosphere, and then when the sky grazer was in a good position below them, they extruded the gas and dove down onto the sky grazers. Then yeah. there was the other example of paragliding. So they tried to explain uh, why the sky grazers could be as large as they are. And once again, we don't know how big they are because it's never really stated. Mm -hmm. uh, but how they could stay airborne in such a dense atmosphere with less effort. Uh, and then they showed a paraglider to explain how this works while showing images of the paraglider. Uh, what other examples did we have? We had... Your cats. Um, so for the younglings, the younglings of the um, sky grazers were, I have to quote, incompetent. <laughs> they just said the youngs are really incompetent, which I found funny. <laughs> and then they showed the children of meerkats, so the baby meerkats, and that they have to learn things first, like, for example, how to react um, when encountering... Uh, Wait, how are they called? Encountering a scorpion. Yeah, scorpion or <laughs> yeah. which. Um... Uh, then you had, when talking about the mating ritual of the sky grazers, you had different examples how sexual selection works on Earth with rhinoceros beetles, where the males develop these big horns, big structures on their front parts. The stalk-eyed flies were the males have standoffs. The males have very extended eye stalks, oh, yeah. like ridiculously looking. <clears throat> and they have these dance-offs, standoffs, where they basically show off their eye stalks. And they do the same thing to females to impress the females. And this was compared to what the sky grazers have because the sky grazers have these long tail structures, uh, which they show off to the females. And yeah, of course they mentioned the Chicxulub impact. So the impact yeah. that, which was at least partially responsible for the, extin the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, because, as Thomas has already said at the end of the episode, we do see this. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, we, we do see this impact. <clears throat> uh, my screensaver went up there. We do see this impact, and yeah, that's where they explain generalists versus specialists. Exactly. Yeah. Um... Then let's move on to the second episode. Yep, we can do that. Which plays on the planet Janus. 
Um, so the interesting thing about that blood is that it's gravitationally locked. Well, no, let's start with that is first of all, it's part of a um, system, solar system with a an, with an red star, um, which is interesting already because we know of a lot of exoplanets that have similar sizes to Earth that are close or in the habitable zone to a red star, a red dwarf. I want to say it's a star, but red dwarf. So that's interesting. It's a very plausible scenario and a scenario that is a lot of thought about in planetary sciences because there are in the habitable zones of these red dwarfs, but could life evolve there, which is not very easy. Um, and it's okay if I could go into a bit of detail here. It wouldn't take long. Oh yeah, of course. I would. I just wanted to ask why exactly that is. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So first of all, the planet, um, the habitable zone of these stars is very close to their, um, well, like very close to them. That's mm. just because they have they put out less energy than like an, than like our sun does, and that's why that the habitable zones, the zones where fluid water is able to exist on the surface is uh, much closer to the star. And this first of all leads to a gravitational locking, which we also have in this scenario and which is also going to be a big part of the show, of the episode. So gravitational locking means that we always, this, the face, you know, the, the planet is always facing the sun, um, one side of the planet is always facing the sun. That's what I want to say. Like our moon, we always see the one side of our moon. Um, so that's interesting because one side will always get the energy of the star, which means it is pretty hot because it's also very close. And the other side is always in the dark. So it never gets sun. And it's very cold, therefore. So that's interesting. And this is also problematic for life. Why? I guess we see that also in the episode itself. Then the second thing that we have is radiation. We are very close to the sun and to the star and while it does emit less energy, it still emits a lot of dangerous, a uh, lot of dangerous radiations. So this is always awesome problem that is talked about when talking about Habitable zones near these stars. And then we have um, some more things which they also kind of talk about. So we have tidal heating because the planet is so close to the star, there are strong tidal forces will actually lead to volcanism in our hydrothermal activity not only due to the interior, so the hot interior of the planet itself, but also due to the tidal forces, like we, for example, see on moons at Jupiter or Saturn, Io, for example, Io, Io, for example, um, which has an, one of the most volcanic active objects in our solar system. And not because of its interior heat, but because of the tidal forces that experiences. And this is not really talked about, but we see hydrothermal activity on a planet later in the episode. And then our next problem, which also makes life more difficult, are stellar variations. So these red dwarfs often fluctuate in their activity, which led to different energy releases over time. And, you know, when we know one thing about life, then it seems that at least kind of stable situations are more, um, are better for life, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, regularity is, I wouldn't say it's a requirement per se, but of course, the more stable an environment is, uh, the less dis distraction there is, the easier it is for life to flourish. Especially like in the first 
first days of life. I think uh, then it can actually get very dangerous. Yeah. For, I mean, who knows? Maybe a bit of chaos is even necessary for life to spring up. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. That's that's a whole different episode or on its own, I think. Yeah. So some examples, if you're interested in that, for planets or systems with red dwarfs and probably habitable planets. And this is for, first of all, the Trappist system, which you probably heard of. So the system of seven, eight, seven, eight or nine, I'm not sure anymore. Um, planets in its orbit and there are two or three in the habitable zone and then we have kepler 186f and kepler 1649c which are the two most earth-like exoplanets there are and they're all orbiting a red dwarf so it seems to be very common and they're all in the habitable zone so life there is possible with these restrictions and how this plays out, well, we will see now in the episode. Okay. So, well, th first of all, thanks for the info because it was this was pretty interesting. I mean, there are some things which are kind of intuitive, but are things you don't really think about at first, because at first, mm, yeah. I, I was like, hey, okay, it's a red dwarf, so what? You're going to require your planet to be closer to the sun or, or to the star. But I re didn't really think about the consequences this would have, so pretty interesting. Yeah, I think too, I think it's actually a very good idea to have this in the episode. Yeah. Um, I think they've made an an interesting scenario here definitely yeah, yeah it was actually kind of my favorite scenario too uh yeah because and maybe i'll just transition into the creatures we encounter here the creatures are also kind of interesting um so at first in the episode they make the point that life can adapt to some very difficult habitats um, they bring this example up of bacteria in sulfuric hot springs in Ethiopia, which is an, uh, it's kind of a difficult comparison, but I, we're going to talk about that in more detail later on. But then we switch over to the planet Janus, and there you have these pentapods, meaning five-legged creatures, which have kind of proboscises or a couple of tentacles with some with feelers some with a uh, little claws on them to manipulate food items and they they say they're about cat sized they are all hermaphroditic so they are male as well as female and they live all over this planet. They're the dominant life form. And they are the dominant life form because they are capable of evolving all kinds of different forms. They do develop differently on the hot side, always facing the sun, than on the cold side, permanently laying in darkness. And there are also some in between forms in the twilight zone in between where you have a little bit of sunlight but not too much and by the way i love the description of uh, the pentapods on the sun side which is slender and skittish <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, that's the basic premise so on the hot side they search shelter wherever they can find they are pretty quick little creatures they take every opportunity to find water, find food, pick up food. Um, while on the permanent night side of the planet, they are, yeah, more stocky, more hairy. They do hunt so-called ground grubs on there. Grubs are little creatures. I don't really know how much they go into detail about their biology right now, but... Little creatures living near, yeah, they, they live near the ground and 
when they're threatened by the pentapods, they warn uh, their companions, their uh, the other grubs by emitting light. So when they jump away, they emit they emit light, which they compare to uh, fireflies here on Earth, which do this mainly for sexual selection, but just to get this point across that creatures can emit light, I think. Uh, while yeah, then communicate. Okay. Exactly, communicate. Yeah, okay, and no, of course, I think fireflies <coughs> do that too. Don't really know too much about fireflies. I um, mean, a sexual mating reason is also communicating, right? Yeah, yeah, and some shit. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, but then again, the pentapods on the cold side they use light signals on some of their proboscis, not proboscis, I think. That's not really fitting here. Their tentacles to lure them in. So they are basically going to hold their uh, tentacles out, very far out. They emit this light pulse and slowly guide their prey towards them, which was also kind of interesting kind of mimicry which they um, I'm just thinking about what was the comparison for that I don't really think they had one it was just I, I mean oh no no they had the fireflies and this predatory firefly oh, yeah exactly yeah yeah emitting so there's a predatory type of firefly emitting signals mimicking the signals of other fireflies but they are not there to mate with them but to eat them exactly uh, and uh, there were some other comparisons there which i honestly wouldn't really go too much into because there were examples like um scorpions have venom yeah the pentapods have venom and then they explained that venom has evolved multiple times on earth by the example of scorpions and there was this example of ants ants developing different yeah. morphologies in a colony <clears throat> trying to get this point across that although some creatures belong to the same genus or species they can take a wide array of forms, which uh, once again, I would already by now, I would like to talk about what I think about these comparisons, but later on. Actually, it is when... interesting because I'm thinking that these examples that you now highlighted are the examples that you maybe have problems with. And mm. interesting lies, these are two examples where I was like, actually, they're kind of good. So I'm interested in, in that discussion. Yeah. Um, maybe to add to the panda pods. Um, so they have eyes in every direction. And because they're five legs, there is no front and back and they can just walk in every direction. Yeah. Uh, which I have found interesting because we don't have this on Earth. We have symmetric, symmetrical animals here on Earth. Yeah, exactly. But once again, they didn't really go into detail why yeah. they had this, yeah, pentamere. Actually, there are creatures with a pentamere, pent, pentametry. Pen, so there are um, echinoderms, sea yeah, urchins, correct. for instance. Sea or, stars, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They so. have uh, pentametry, I think it's called sure. symmetry we are bilateral animals we have two sides and these creatures sea yeah. urchins sea stars they have five okay. five planes of symmetry basically uh, but i think they didn't really go into too much detail why exactly they chose to give them a pentamere symmetry no they just said that that's why they were, you yeah. know, very, um, they can walk fast and stuff like that. I mean, um, the, the, this life doesn't have anything to do with life on Earth, so they definitely yeah. didn't want to make the point that 
it was something related to uh, echinoderms. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I just think it's an interesting detail. So maybe one more thing I wanted to add because I wasn't sure you talked about it, but I'm not sure if you get into detail of that. Yeah. Um, where they made and laid the eggs. Yep, that's yeah. the final thing I would now like to talk about because uh, and once again, this is something I didn't really understand in detail, but they actually made, so they live all over this planet as described, but they made only in the twilight zone where valleys formed. And uh, they and the twilight zone is the sorry the twilight zone is the terminator, which means the you know the line where day and night meet. So yeah. kind of like twilight zone, I think is a good word for that. But the 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 word that you will find in literature is probably terminator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is where they meet, where they mate already said they are male and female as well. So they inseminate each other and then they release their larvae into the air and they disperse all over the planet. The one thing I didn't really get was what were these forms meeting there? Do they, during their life at some point, migrate to the Terminator? or and change while going to that place or were these just in between forms i didn't really get that to be honest aren't there animals that like fish um that will get back to their mating um mating places once yeah, yeah. in their life yeah, but I'm just really asking because I didn't understand it here because they look different than both forms on hot and cold side. Oh, oh and, interesting. I didn't realize yeah. that. And I thought it would be pretty weird if only the ones by chance landing in the zone around the Terminator, around the Twilight Zone, would mate. Because then what's really yeah, the maybe point they of... Have like all these animals on the extreme side. Yeah, maybe they have like, they didn't explain it, but maybe they have like certain uh, um, specimen of these, of these animals are only there for, for mating, like similar to ants where we have the queen. Yeah, but then again, what's the purpose of these other creatures? I mean, not that... That would yeah, be pretty yeah, deterministic to say what's the purpose of these other other animals. They just live there and maybe they just never mate, but I think that's not really a good strategy for a living form. Yeah, I, I just yeah. wondered because this was one of the things they never truly explained. True. Uh, I didn't think about it, but yeah, you're yeah, yeah. right. I mean, I mean, I think the most logical thing would be they migrate to... Uh, towards these uh, deep bridges, towards the twilight zone. Um, and they just change while doing so at some point in their lives, in their life cycles. Yeah. Just an interesting thought, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe one more thing, or mm -hmm. two things actually I wanted to add. So, or do you have anything you want to say to the... No, to this no. topic. I would okay. uh, swiftly move on to the next episode after your point. Okay. So on the dark side, they said that they're using hydrothermal activity for energy, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was interesting and which kind of is like, you know, maybe a hint to the tidal forces, even if they, they do mm -hmm. not address it. But it was like very large active um hydrothermal activity so mm. it kind of looked cool and then the second thing is in the end they talk about water and why oh. water is so important for life yeah. um, and they talk about maybe these hydrothermal vents you know similar to earth are possible scenario to where life has formed in the first place 
Oh yeah, that so, wasn't that was in reference to the hydrothermal activity there, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And then they just told the the Goldilocks story, which I found nice. So Goldilocks is the the Goldilocks zone is the capital zone and it comes from an um I think an story from Iceland. It's a very old story and about a person called Goldilocks. And I just found I actually found it nice that they're talking about it. But yeah, that's that that wraps, uh, wraps up the episode. Uh, but I just I don't really want to trigger you into a twenty minute monologue once again. But <laughs> they didn't really talk about uh, this whole red dwarf scenario you laid out before. No. How the Goldilocks zone would be different on such a star, and this I think was was a waste. It was a pity. Yeah, exactly. They, they just they basically just used that the star uh, that the planet is um, gravitationally locked, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. That like all the other implications that the scenarios would have, um, they don't talk about that, which I also think is a bit sad. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next episode, Eden. Indeed. So, Eden is a planet which I think is um, very similar in size to Earth, I would guess. They don't talk about it, but it seems like very similar. Um, the special thing about this planet, and I don't go into that much detail about the planet, but a scenario is following that we have a binary star system. So we have two stars. And this is um, very common. So it actually kind of seems like that maybe stars or systems with two stars are maybe even at some scale at least in the early days of the system more common than solar systems with one star and these systems are also so planets can orbit two stars at the same time they are different you know, there are different um, scenarios how this would look like, but it's definitely is possible. So for how it looks here, and they actually didn't go into much detail, which I also think was kind of sad, but so one star is in the center, then the other star probably orbits this one star, and then this planet orbits both of the stars. So the planet still has a night and a day side it's not like there are stars and two sides of the planet or somehow like that something like that so yeah this is the this is the scenario yeah an overabundance of energy yeah a lot of solar energy yeah yeah and this is yeah, basically, actually, we discussed about this before the episode because we weren't really sure how exactly this was meant to translate to the planet because um, there is nothing as special as has been shown or as on the nose as has been shown on the other planets, like dense clouds of spores in episode one or this extreme cold and hot sides on in the in the second episode but yeah i think your point about the whole planet being covered in something kind of like a jungle would maybe make kind of sense because this seemed to be the case mm. so and yeah. yeah the creatures we have is at the base i'll just start on the base of the food chain because at the base we have what they call a fungus and once again I'm going to get into why I find that problematic later on. Yeah. Um, then you have weird bunny moth type of creatures. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know which... what, 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 what I call them? Yeah. Um... Ape insect rabbits. That um, <laughs> but I, moths is actually nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually heard that in another review, to be honest. Uh, uh, but I think it's it's very fitting. It's very fitting, and uh, yeah, it's definitely fitting. Yeah, and th so they um, 
find their food on the fungus. The fungus produces some kind of fluid they feast on, and uh, then you have really very primate-like predators living among the trees, hunting, yeah, the insect, rabbit, animals, animal-type things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's or how I called them basically monkeys with extra rubber arms, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, the did you notice that these arms, while not being extended, looked like yeah, bony arms, so they have this extra set of arms between their. Yeah, what we in primates would call legs and arms, which uh, are kind of hidden all the time until they go to hunt. And when while they hunt, they can just raise their upper body and fire out these long rubber arms. Uh, and what I found really strange was that, if not extended, they looked bony. They looked like a structure with supported by bone, surrounded by muscle, and then all of a sudden they started to stretch out, like in The Incredibles, like Elastic, Elastic Girl in The Incredibles. I just thought it, it, it looked strange, because if you would have a some kind of a bony structure on the inside, a system consisting of bones on the inside, muscles on the outside, this wouldn't be capable of stretching that much, but it's just an observation I made. Mm. Oh, can I... Uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, you know, on my second screen, basically, I have the, um, yeah, the guide to the show from... Um, um oh jeez i'm so bad with names um from um darren nash darren nash i'm cutting that out I'm, that's not in the <laughs> <laughs> darren nash um and he calls these um rabbit moths um, <laughs> actually um that they have these rapid Lepidopterans and Lepidopterans are moths and uh, butterflies. So, yeah, they actually thought about this. This was their their thinking behind them. Yeah. Mm, so, yeah, I mean, it makes kind of sense because butterflies, some moths, they do use uh, they do use plants. They do use flowers as their main food oh, source. Yeah. Right. yeah, okay, then that explains the similarities. Yeah, but that makes sense. I, yeah, basically what what they wanted to show here was how complex uh, how complex food chains can work because yeah. It it doesn't just end with this predator prey relationship because yeah. um during summer, the uh, moth bunny rabbits, <laughs> they detach their sexual or organs. So their sexual organs are kind of worm-like structured, worm-like creatures on their own. Maybe you've seen when some kinds of cephalopods can detach one of their arms with their sexual organs on there and inseminate a female uh it reminded me kind of of that and i heard that some worms can actually do something similar so their their oh. sexual organs they detach they combine with one another and they form a cocoon where the new uh i think they were called grazers yeah grazers correctly grazers where the next generation can grow yeah and these uh, cagoons kind of lay down on the ground and then they have like this tentacles when how they move up the trees and then they're yeah. hanging just down the trees yeah 
and later in the summer then this this once again quote unquote fungus starts infecting the grazers and what it does is it does it does something which actually happens with some fungi on earth it changes the behavior of its host they lose their fear of the predators the predators can easier consume them and then they poison well the predators the fungus poisons the predators and by that it achieves that uh, it has a food source for a new fungus to grow and on the other hand it helps with dispersing and then during the winter the grazers they die off the adult grazers die off the predators they move off for the winter and as soon as the summer or spring arrives the new grazers hatch from their cocoons and the cycle repeats yeah that uh, was actually and... a very complex cycle and to be fair i didn't really understand it at first um yeah, but of and... course the plan for the fungi was just to hatch new fungi but this just seems so weird complex <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like this was and... so many steps yeah yeah and i think it's i don't know it, it was so strange because you would you i mean in nature nothing is de deterministic in that sense so it's not that oh an organism definitely has to develop away from a certain habit because it harms itself while doing that in the case of the grazers my f mm. usually you would think hey how would, would they still consume these fungi if in the end they are responsible for them dying off making them an easy meal yeah but then again so i i still think it's it was weird because the grazers seem to have absolutely no defense against this but then again in nature it's about whether well something just works or not and they made the point that they reproduce before the fungus can infect them so rep reproduction is a done deal before they fall victim to the predators and it was all about timing i still think it was a pretty weird decision to have them basically defenseless because this via natural selection over time i would say you would expect something to occur for the individuals being most resistant against this infection would usually tend to survive over time and so over time some kind of defense would likely develop or at least some kind of yeah. avoidance for these fungi would develop or a preference for fungi being less infective it was just i don't know it was a weird decision and they made all these points and this is where i would like to shortly mention the comparisons they make they go about all these different yeah ecological relationships but i don't think that really they they fit too much in this case because yeah for one they didn't use th this certain fungus infecting ants on earth because there is a fungus on earth infecting ants changing their behavior for them to climb the highest thing they can find mm from where then new spores can disperse and i think there's one other form uh, which infects ants and makes them search other search out other ants to infect them and they didn't use this example but instead instead went with showing mycorrhiza fungi the fungi having a symbiosis with the roots of trees creating huge networks and this was where everything felt kind of shaky and this is why honestly i wouldn't go into too much detail about these examples because uh, i think they weren't really fitting here 
Yeah, one, I have one question for you because I didn't really understand that. So they had this whole point about symbiosis and they showed the example of the humans um, in Africa um, with these special birds where like the birds, um, they let the birds search for honey mm. and then the humans will take the honey and give the birds some of the honey. Mm. Um so symbiosis. I, I thought this was a cool example because I didn't know of that and I actually think, oh, humans living in symbiosis with other animals is always cool. But where exactly in this food chain is symbiosis? Because in the end, everybody dies but the fungus. So yeah, yeah. I couldn't really see where the symbiosis part was. Yeah, that's that's also the thing that well, they made this point about there is a complex symbiosis, so a relationship everybody benefits from. And yeah, this is kind of the case, at least for the grazers and the fungus. But the predators... The predators really... Like the fungi let them eat, but they're still killing yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the point. It made the grazers an easy meal and i mean maybe you could have avoided this uh you could have avoided this by maybe saying that the fungus only infects some of the predators that maybe they have a pretty active immune system against or it, no it it wasn't even an infection they poisoned them yeah, maybe that they have yeah, maybe that some are resistant or most are pretty resistant to the poison or that not in all cases. That I, I don't know. It's just me trying to make sense. But yeah, in the end, the predators, they just lose. They have an easy meal, but yeah, they pay for it with their lives. So what's the point of having an easy meal? Yeah. So yeah, it was this episode was really very shaky for me and the comparisons yeah. they were pretty random i think i think we will get all studios in our end yeah discussion. indeed but that's just i just wanted to explain why we wouldn't go into too much detail here or explain or talk about all different comparisons yeah uh, and then maybe last point they, about the planet is that the planet has a strong seasonal effect so the planet is tilted like 40 degrees, which is incredible, an incredible large degree. Um, mm. So this would end up in a very strong seasonal effect. Which we see. Uh, huh? Which we see. Which we see. I mean, yes, but, but no. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean... We, they, tell, they say that there are seasons and like the you know the, the life cycle is based on the seasons but it doesn't seem like there are large seasonal effects yeah I mean they showed it by telling us that or by indicating that it becomes dark for long periods of time and, mm. yeah it was just over jumped a bit I thought but yeah, yeah. Um, okay next episode final episode yeah so nothing directly too much to say about the planet itself it's called terra and the planet is probably very very off like we have a very similar scenario to our system basically um, yeah just yeah, just just want yeah. to throw that in here uh the only note i have for the basic scenario is basically earth in 4.5 billion years so yeah <laughs> um so the scenario is following the star is getting at the edge of his lifetime which means that the radiation and the emitting of energy starts to grow it gets um higher um this is interesting with stars because i think you would normally guess that the energy output will become less and less over time but it actually is getting more and more over time. 
and then at some point the start will start to grow after i think near it depends on the star but in this case it's at nine billion years um and then once the star is growing, of course, the habitable zone will start to shift. In the case of Earth, this would be, well, or in our solar system, this would be the case that Earth will lose its ability to host um, fluid water. So at one point in, I think actually earlier than 9 billion years, because this is more than gradual change, but in like the next two, maybe 3 billion years now a scenario, this in our Earth scenario, this what will end up in Earth not being able to um, possess any fluid water anymore. Up to the point of extreme where Earth could be swallowed by the sun. And this is the scenario here. The once habitable planet is not habitable anymore because the sun's intensity is growing. So the things that live on the planet, which are in this case um, actually a highly advanced civilization has to move to another planet. And this is the story of this episode. Yeah. Uh, I think it was on the grand scheme of things way more philosophical than what the other episodes were because while at the other three episodes were mostly about speculative evolution and astrobiology general basics of evolutionary theory in some respects this one also was it was pretty much what could happen to humanity one day if we we managed to survive long enough and also it tackled a lot of questions like how should we yeah, how should we go about living in space? How should we go about our future in general and this and that? And it was more philosophical than really speculative evolution, I think. And it was basically... Yeah, of, hmm? uh, of, of course. But I mean, talking about an advanced civilization fits into the concept of the show because... The, it's an interesting question. How could an, another civilization live like? I mean, it's an it's a an science yeah. right? question about science. And I don't really know how you would do it in a non-philosophical way because it's so much more difficult yeah. than... No, of course. But I, the thing is, I came for alien creature type things. Uh, and I don't know. It was... This was the episode, I think, with the least really biological in input, you know. I think for a show yeah. centered around biology, this was... It, of course, it, we are a biological species. We This is going... In, in some sense, this is what biological beings could develop into. Because the aliens, in this case weren't even physical beings anymore or they were but only their brains because their brains exist in yeah in tanks and they are fed glucose produced by plants so they have photosynthesizing plants and then robots carry the glucose over to the brains the brains are individuals but they are connected to one another and they basically act as one super organism. Um, and this could, I mean, if a life form manages to, well, still stay alive for long enough, this could be what biology could develop into in the future. But I don't know, for me, it was just, it was any astro astronomy documentary about humanity's future ever no and yeah yeah i i and i mean i i get what you say but i actually find it a an, an cool idea to have this in the episode and this in the mm. show so i actually was not hyped about it but i thought that it was a cool idea so i think we can discuss this in the 
and like the overall discussion i think this fits really nicely into i think our main discussion point and this is yeah. what this yeah. show is all about in the first case yeah but i don't know i just really don't have too much to say here because it's they go about how they they gain energy get their energy and about the future of space travel and um, yeah i mean i can go into detail here um so the scenario is following their planet is inhabitor anymore and that's why they want to move to another planet so they put um sent robots robot robot what <laughs> robots <laughs> robots jesus they sent robots into space to an ice planet that is um far away from the sun and these robots and or an um ai in the end is then terraforming this new ice planet into another habitable planet and in the end they're moving all away from their original host planet to this newer planet that they terraformed now so they you know they go off the life cycle of the sun and then they have to well move to another planet this is like the whole scenario the the thing that i think is a bit confusing or was a bit confusing for me is that they live in these boxes why do they need a planet in the first place you know they could just stay in space yeah I mean, yeah, yeah 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 indeed they terraform the new planet they're living on why the hell would they do that for, <laughs> for what in boxes yeah but yeah, on the other hand but on the other hand, that's a point we both always keep coming back to, especially when exploring the human past. Sometimes we just do things because we can, and sometimes we just do them because yeah. we find them nice. And I mean, yeah, that's true. just because they are very advanced, who maybe they still have a sense of beauty. I mean, we never get to, or of aesthetics, of maybe they just feel more at home. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, and it, that's the that's really interesting uh, because <laughs> this was exactly what I was thinking at first. <laughs> but yeah, yeah but then again, point. yeah, intelligent beings sometimes that, just do things. <laughs> yeah, I often think that we kind of try to. I don't want that to sound too negative, but it, for me, it seems that often when talking about the human history things are sometimes a bit over overfought because in the end nobody told us to build a large tower like Bush al Khalif, you know we, we just yeah. did it because we want to build a high tower like there is no there is no really large reason behind it i mean i guess you could say that this is like an important part of humanity or the psychological you know the psychology of humans and yes that's true but there's like no large reason behind it. We don't try to do science with it or look at the stars or, you know, we, we just done it because why not? Yeah. yeah, I mean, why do we place carpets on the floor? Why do we yeah. choose certain furniture? Because it makes us feel more at home and... I mean, often we tend to imagine future civilizations as these basically emotion-ridden beings, uh, just rationally thinking beings. And this was kind of the vibe I was getting here at first, at least. But then yeah. again, who knows? It's it's never explored, but this was one True. of the most interesting details i think this uh, it was just intended as this throwaway line yet yet they terraform the planet but <laughs> i think it was way more interesting than they intended yeah definitely and then before we can get to the end discussion uh, i guess two more things are interesting so first of all they explore the whole scenario how would they get the energy i mean this is similar to the episodes before but now on another scale, how does the civilization gets the energy? And they talk about solar energy here on Earth. And in their case, they're also using the solar energy with a Dyson sphere, basically. So 
an orbital constellation around their sun, which is getting the energy directly out of the sun. Um, then, oh, they had two more points quickly. Then they talk about the dangers for space travel, I guess. So this star has a high energy flux and is like shooting out solar radiation, which destroys one of their ships, which I thought, well, I guess they could have, you know, had an, mm. some way to encounter that, I guess. Yeah. They are super advanced, but they can predict any kind of solar flares or... Yeah, I mean, predicting them is probably really yeah, difficult, yeah. but like... Yeah, I just, just noticed. Exactly. Uh, I just noticed it. But then again, super advanced civilization. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, they could <laughs> maybe protect, you know, protect them against it. Or anything. Yeah. And then the last point is, um, yeah, the, I think the most philosophical point here. And this is like, how should we message aliens in the first place? And they, or should we message like us as humans, um, aliens in the first place? And they talk about the Arecibo message, which is a very famous message that we sent out of the Arecibo telescope. And then they've gone into this whole point, like this one, I think, physician? Physicist. F phys <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah. <Physicist. laughs> yeah. Uh, about this one physicist who wants to send messages to space with the Arecibo message, uh, Arecibo mm. telescope, and... Rest in pieces. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think this guy needs to search for a new plan. Well, uh, just, just to remind everyone who maybe doesn't know, the Arecibo uh, telescope collapsed a few weeks but, uh, back in December, I think, or November. Yeah. Unfortunately. I think this discussion is always funny. I mean, they're always they're also talking about it later, but just in a small sentence. Mm. We're discussing if we should message aliens, but I mean, we're doing it currently. We're sending out data all the time. So if you would like directly encode something into the data or just send out our radio data, in the end, doesn't really change anything. They know we're here in the first place. At yeah. some point, or maybe not, because nobody's out there where we need to ask. But yeah, yeah, and then again, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and then again, space is super vast. Yeah, and I think the chances of something arriving anywhere where a civilization might be uh, while we are still alive, because chances are we are going to go extinct at some point um yeah they're pretty 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 small i think yeah i always have this thought in my mind which i think is nice i mean it isn't really practical but it's kind of a cool thought that like in some billion years just some or million years just some random civilization gets our message messages and they just know well they are dead since long ago, probably, but our, you know, our messages will be still out there yeah. traveling through space. And that's, I honestly, that's kind of a really kind of creepy feeling. But then again, on the other hand, I yeah. think a very, very intriguing thought of, yeah, these radio beacons of our existence of our existence being out there for a long time after we're gone basically being out there for as long as the universe exists extending out and potentially one day telling something that we were here yeah it's like, exactly like you said it, it's kind of creepy uh, you kind of get a shivering out of it or like a weird feeling in your neck but at the same time, it's so cool to think about. It's yeah. like a cool yeah. creepiness. Yeah. Yeah. There is no need to immortalize ourselves because we've effectively already done so. I mean, these signals, I, I... they do grow fainter over time, don't they? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Probably also redshift. So I don't know 
for how long you're able to encode them. Yeah, but then again, immortality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's just let's just pretend that we have immortalized ourselves to feel comfy or something. Uh, yeah, I think you get a point of the episode. <laughs> it's very <right>. yeah. <laughs> philosophical. Um, <laughs> I think aliens is also definitely a topic that we will get back to at some point. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I hope so. Um, I think we'll do so again and again. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's open the floor for the main discussion. <laughs> <laughs> One and a half hours in. Yeah. Uh, already looked at the clock like every... Yeah. minute i mean we've already talked about certain points i would yeah. really what i would like to try now is uh really try to at first figure out who this this who this uh documentary was made for in the first place to yeah. maybe seek out the target audience and try to evaluate whether it can convey its message to its target audience and then maybe we can get into the more personal perspective maybe summing up our thoughts yeah so did you read a text from Neish? Mm, not yet because i tried to go into this with as few reviews as possible i mean it's not a review because he worked on it yeah, but he was I part don't... of the writing process and he, he kind of explained their thoughts, why they did special, you know, certain things. Mm. And um, there is one thing I want to add now in the discussion, you know, who, the, for who this, you know, this show was actually made. Mm. And so he talks about two rules for the concept. And rule number four is that you have to end up, I'm quoting here, Rule number four is that you have to end up with a product that is entertaining to the public at large. Those mm -hmm. of us interested in science, especially in deep, hard, heavy and complex stuff, might not like it, but that's a fact. If anyone is going to watch the series, they simply must be entertained, otherwise they will stop. Yeah, uh, so he summed it up perfectly. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah great because this is i think pretty much how we feel about this yeah as well so it it's nice that yeah it shows that it worked out pretty much as it was intended yeah i guess at least from the perspective of the both both of us uh I mean, it's pretty simple biology. So you could really go into this without uh, truly, I think, any real kind of proper proper knowledge about evolution and biology. Maybe some very basic stuff. You should know what genders are. <laughs> yeah. You have to be uh, interested in that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, you don't need any knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, I think this is also why they decided to go with a very basic terminology. So they strew, they strew in the one or other term like mimicry, mimicking another organism, meaning that uh, they strew some terms in, but for the most part, everything was pretty basic and everything was explained very, very thoroughly. And I think, honestly, sometimes a bit too much to the degree that yeah. I thought the episode feels a bit dragging right now. Maybe even yeah. to someone who doesn't know these things, because once you've heard about this, it's enough, we can move on. And this is also, yeah, kind of related to the point that they spend, f from my personal perspective, too much time on Earth. Yeah, so we get the shot or like the, the the visuals from the planet and like for one minute and then you will be like 10 minutes on earth looking at an example and then moving back to 
the planet for like another minute and moving back to Earth for 10 minutes. So you will end up actually not that much time on the planet and you don't see these um, these animals. You know, I, I want to see more of these animals. And mm-hmm. this is my, like, my, my main point, my main problem. They have this very cool concept, like, oh, we have a high gravity system and red dwarf system and binary solar system. So cool. And then they have these cool animals and I want to see these animals, how they live, how they, you know, just how they interact with their, with their nature. I want to see more of that, but you kind of end up seeing them not very often. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I think for me, at least the trailers just made me expect something this documentary really wasn't because I was, I expected something like uh, alien, alien planet, this documentary where they actually set up a whole planet. They simu- the, the scenario was that two space probes uh, would land there and just explore the planet. And you would just, through their exploration of the planet, follow them and explore the ecosystems of, I think the planet was called Darwin 4. Something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know, it was... I would really have to watch the trailer again because I really had the impression that this was something like that. And I was really, really hyped. And in the end, I was just really disappointed because then I wrote down the times. For the most part, you spend about one and a half minutes to three minutes, three and a half minutes, something like that, on the alien world with sometimes really, really again and again repeating sequences shots you've or scenes you have seen a couple of times before uh, and then you would spend just 10 minutes on earth uh, five to ten minutes and this yeah it didn't really work for me i mean cgi is expensive but it's just unfortunate that from the trailer i really got something very different i expected something very different yeah, you can expect it kind of walking with dinosaurs, but with aliens. Walk, walking with aliens. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the idea to compare it with Earth, I think it's a good idea because in the end, at least life would be in some way similar to Earth because we encounter the same problems. You know, the same things we have to overcome. Um, so I think the idea with comparing it to Earth it's a good idea because you can catch people with that because you have this this key to reality to something we know but just less less earth and, and more aliens would would have done it mm. for me yeah, and the problem also was that the comparisons sometimes and we already got into that earlier um but the comparisons sometimes they are yeah not really fitting they seemed forced yeah like Like, oh we need a comparison now what what can we put in yeah and i i i had this weird feeling that the longer the series went on from episode to episode episode these examples would become more yeah disjointed more random and yeah as you said forced um i mean one thing was what i already talked about this example of well just not using fungi which actually infect and manipulate their host on earth but instead going with completely different unrelated examples and even examples not really fitting to that or when they can the from the first episode the predators uh, rushing down onto the sky grazers, um, they compared it, they compared these creatures to falcons, and they made a point that falcons they dive down onto their prey, grasping them with their claws, and then when they showed the predators hunt, actually they first of all they hunted in groups and not as single animals, but hey, fine so far. 
but then they didn't really seem to use their impact or anything or their for downward momentum. They just seemed to break, to slow down, just shy of the Sky Grazer. Then they just held on to the Sky Grazers with their claws and slowly just put their proboscises through these creatures' skin and tried to slow it down with the air sacs. They reinflated their air sacs and tried to slow the Sky Grazer down and force it to the ground. And this, it's just, yeah, I get the point. They gain height and they seek for prey from up there and they then dive down onto them. But it, these are in detail two very different mechanisms or no. Yeah, the, the, I mean, in this case, maybe it's a bit nitpicky. I see that because they went, f they they wanted the viewer to understand the very basics behind that, and the basics maybe in this case was they search prey from above and then they dive down no. onto their prey. Maybe, but as soon as you go into detail problems arise and especially in the third episode these examples they were pretty much random you're talking about a planet with an overabundance of energy and all of a sudden you're talking about hummingbirds on earth and yeah they made this point maybe about nectar plants and animals interacting but i think they really didn't translate that onto the screen too much. Often I had this feeling that what they were trying to convey, that that I didn't really get what they were trying to convey until really thinking about it, until it's making terrific. connections myself. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I understand that. Um, yeah, I, I actually think I don't add anything here because that just how I feel too. Um, at some certain points, uh, I think we've already seen that I thought a bit different about it maybe, but I guess let's not go into detail because of time here. Just in general, I um, have the same thoughts about it. There may be at some cert certain points, I thought that these uh, comparisons are fine, I guess, but for most of the parts, I'm agreeing with you here. Yeah. Um, then maybe I think we can cut it down very shortly. You already you also um, kind of talked about it before. Using words like fungus and animals mm. might be easy, but it's not a universal thing. These are like animals here or like living things here on Earth are called. And we probably would not call anything fungi on another mm. planet, right? Yeah. These are because... like, yeah, hmm? <laughs> yeah. You can you can speak. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think this is going to be an episode. I don't really know how much speaking time I've got, but uh, I just feel bad because I've been talking so much. Um, uh, I I have the feeling that I didn't really let you talk for. Ah, too, it's okay. too I mean, I talked about the planets, right? Uh, and yeah, I but, talked about in the end with, with the, uh, the last episode. Yeah. yeah, but that's the final thing I would also have mentioned in terms of really critical stuff. Um, of course, using these terms. Um, I mean, I get it because it's always easier to to just say it's an animal, it's some kind of plant, it's some kind of fungi. In the series, they use them as descriptive terms, but strictly speaking, these are not descriptive terms. These are systematic terms. And the way these terms work in biology is if you are a fungus, no matter how f well evolved you are no matter how maybe weird you have become over time you do always remain a fungus for one example i always go back with is fish we the land vertebrates have developed from from fish 
So technically speaking, we are all fish because just because you change a lot via evolution, you don't really, you never evolve out of a group. You are still part of that group. And this, and this that is, is what, not becoming a bird just because it can fly. <laughs> you know. Exactly. Exactly. These are not descriptive terms. If you are an animal, it implies that you belong to the kingdom of animalia. So, meaning that all animals have a common ancestor. You couldn't just call an alien an animal because uh, it looks like an animal on Earth, because that would imply that it's related to the animals on Earth you would have. That's why I've tr been trying to use terms like animal-like creatures, because they yeah. resemble these on Earth, but they are not. And okay, one final exactly. thing, one final critical thing. Uh, fungi, plants, uh, really, this series focused a lot of, a lot on animal type creatures. Uh, yeah. So um, they used them, mostly they used these terms for animal type creatures, but yeah, fungus, plants. But honestly, that's pretty Curry. much it. Uh, fine for um, what it wanted to achieve uh problem for me was in the detail yeah um so for my conclusion would be when i saw the first episode i was kind of sad because what it was not what i've expected and i also actually was kind of bored <laughs> while watching it then with the second episode i did understood their concept and I just tried to go with the concept. And at that point, I kind of start liking it for what it was. Like, it is an episode, like a TV show to get everyone on board. Make, let them be interested in evolution. Let them be interested in science and space exploration. And at that point, I kind of liked it because it showed so many different things in one episode. Um, so many different concepts in one episode. They talked about how to find exoplanets. And then they talked about biology again. And for that, I liked it because, you know, it just showed so many cool things. Um, so I actually enjoyed the last three episodes. You can say I enjoyed them. It's okay. I enjoyed them and I thought they were good for what they were. But I personally, you know, liked the concept for maybe in future other serious TV show would be going with the same concept. Having, I mean, Nash talks about the, the way how they did the show. And this was basically someone made a planet and then they just gave them the planet and said, well, let's build animals and fill this planet with life. And I think this is a cool concept for a next TV show. Maybe even every, um, um, uh, uh wait what is it called uh tv shows or series are made in different seasons seasons right correct <laughs> um like one season one planet and then just show the life of the planet in detail yeah. show how they live show how they you know how they just interact with nature around them yeah, and then yeah. in the next season go to the next planet yeah, maybe that would be a way to kind of unify the general viewer who just just chimes in because he's heard of the series or he was just intrigued by the title, by the trailer. Um, and the ones who really want to go into a bit more detail. And I think this yeah. would be a, co a good way to kind of try and attempt or to satisfy both kinds of viewers, maybe. Yeah, but I guess, yeah, it's a question of money. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. CGI is really expensive. Yeah, and then and probably, it, and it, you know, and it, <laughs> doing this is probably, sorry, doing this is probably kind of risky because you're doing a whole season on one planet. And if the show, you know, doesn't work financially, yeah. then, yeah. I mean, it's Netflix. I would say they have a good budget and I want to... I want to point out this was pretty good CGI, so this wasn't... Yeah. Nah, I think that was why it was cut so short, because it, 
certainly was expensive. Um, Definitely, and, yes. And that's also a question of personal taste, I think. But I would honestly even willingly sacrifice some of that CGI quality for more content. Yeah, what I thought was it was a bit too much CGI. You know, you have Earth. I mean, sure, we have different plants and stuff on Earth, but then you use just rocks and mm. try to build a CGI around on real footage. Um, in that case, you would end up with much less. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I think less CGI could have actually helped maybe the looks and maybe, but it looked good, but maybe it yeah. could have even made it more better and it could end up using less money, but I don't know. So that's the two students giving advice to million dollar companies and <laughs> yeah, Netflix but... call us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we have a concept. But once again, I don't want this to sound too arrogant. This is really just us having some thoughts on this. Uh, once again, I think for what it tried to do, it was really good. Um, for me, it was the reason I had my problems with it mainly was because I was expecting something else. Um, and to a certain degree, maybe that's on me myself. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, I mean, I'm the biology nerd, so I am more in the category of people who always wish for something more and uh, they could have put this in and that in but i know that it just doesn't work that way and that you need to pay attention to everyone and keep everyone involved mostly meaning the general audience and for that you need yeah as stated before entertainment yeah that's just like our point of view looking at the series um and it's yeah for that matter just you know, our opinion from our point of view. And as we said, different people would probably react differently to that show. There was also a lot of good. Um, I saw like it was mixed. Some people were have like, I guess the same problems that we had, but there were many people that really liked it. So, yeah. 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 Especially the more casual viewers, like, for example, my stepdad, he's very much interested in natural sciences, more astronomy and such, but. I think he really enjoyed it and he's not too much into biology. He learned something new and yeah, he really liked it. So that's the first person I really heard from uh, who watched it, who's close to me. Huh. Cool. Or not the first person, I had, not in terms of the first person telling me he likes it, but he was the first one I got a mini review from. <laughs> <laughs> okay um i think this concludes our main part yeah do you have i would like... say so okay then <laughs> it was also <laughs> already long as planned <laughs> yeah, we'll see uh, what i can cut uh, um, yes every time yes every time so thanks for listening if you stayed for such a long time um, we will hear each other in the next podcast in two weeks, which oh, will be, if everything stays as planned, um, about Mounts and Talents, correct? Exactly. So All we right. decided to do this episode after we reviewed Dante's Peak in the, at the end of last year. And at first we thought about maybe making this episode five to get it closer to the Dante's Peak review, but... Yeah, we really wanted to uh, offer our thoughts on Alien Worlds because it was a re it's a recent new topic and a recent new, a new documentary. So we wanted to get this one in at first. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to the next episode. Um, it's a very... I really like the topic. It's one of my favorite um volcanic topics <laughs> this eruption so thanks for listening and see you next time bye bye thanks for listening to the rocket terrain podcast 
If you enjoyed listening to us, please consider subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Everything addressed in this podcast reflects our own opinion. You can contact us at 4.5GA in the making at gmail.com. That is 4.5GA in the making at gmail.com. All music used is from Kevin McLeod and was downloaded from filmmusic.io under the Creative Commons license. That is heavy interlude for intro and outro and home bass groove for intermission. Oh. Ja, da einfach ja. aufhören. Ja, nee, gar nichts sagen, einfach aufhören. Yeah, and yeah. I think this. Thanks for listening to the. <laughs>